Hi there, Steve Kaufman. I decided to move outside for this video. Um, can't see very well here, squinting with the sun in my eyes. Hopefully this works out, I'll have a look later on. Slavic languages, my experience in learning uh, four, to varying degrees of, of fluency, four different Slavic languages. And I'm gonna talk a little bit longer than my um, recent three, four minute uh, videos. So those who aren't interested or don't like the longer videos can turn off the video right now. Um, you know, one of the, uh, one thing I should say too, uh, to me these videos, it's, it's a form of sitting around a coffee table and talking, so I often don't know what I'm gonna say when I start out. I really wish that some of the people who are part of my YouTube community uh, live nearby so that we could get together uh, you know, regularly and chat about different things, but of course we can't. The, one of the great things about learning languages is that it's a way of discovering the world. Uh, and of course we create our own language worlds, and we do that by finding things of interest, uh, at least I do, whether it be in libraries, on the internet, wherever it might be. And through that we create our own language world and we discover things about the world. And, I, you know, I, when I wrote my book on language learning, I had this uh, reference to Zhuangzi and Taoist philosophy, and I think it was Lao Tzu that says that we can discover the whole world by looking outside our window or something. I mean, we have this tremendous ability to, to learn about so many things today without going very far. So, the Slavic languages, I mean, if we, uh, if we look at a map of the world, we see this area north of the Black Sea, this grand, vast area of steppe land where apparently the, the proto-Slavic people originated from. And today we have a great variety of Slavic languages. And they differ from each other because of the different sort of historical influences that affected the development of these languages. Um, another thing that I firmly believe is that, that culture or language is not in any way associated with our genes or DNA, so that language doesn't equal some kind of ethnic division necessarily. It, it, often it matches, but it doesn't have to match. Uh, so, we have what they normally talk about as the Eastern Slavic languages, which is, you know, Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian the Western Slavic languages, which is Polish, Czech, Slovakian, and then the Southern Slavic languages, which is the languages of the former Yugoslavia, Serb, Serbo, Croat, Slovenian, uh, and so forth, um, uh, Bulgarian. My experience has been that uh, I studied Russian first, and, and I would recommend that because Slavic language speakers, that's a large group of people. And geographically, it covers, obviously, most of Russia. And it's not just the sort of ethnic Russians who are S Russian speakers. There's a Russian is sort of a lingua franca in uh, Central Asia uh, and other countries of the former Tsarist Empire, uh, Soviet Union. So it covers all of that and right into Eastern Europe. And so I started learning Russian because that was the biggest one and that's where I had exposure to Russian literature as a teenager and wanted to read those books in the original language. Uh, and then with the development of the whole Ukrainian crisis, I started watching Ukrainian television, couldn't understand what the Ukrainians were saying, uh, but only what the Russians were saying. So, and yet it sounded so similar, I felt as if I should understand it. And there were words there that were similar, but I just didn't quite get the gist of what they were saying. And this gets back too to this idea that you can't just have a few words, you know, some people say if you have a thousand words, you can 70% of any context, but in fact that is never true because very often the key words are just those words that you don't understand. So I started learning Ukrainian. Ah, I should step back. I did uh, Czech before Ukrainian. And the reason for that was that uh, my father and my parents were born in uh, what became Czechoslovakia. They were born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So I always wanted to learn that language, never understood any of it. And I figured now with Russian it would be easier. Well, it's easier, okay, and I'm rambling here a bit, but the grammar of those uh, Slavic languages that I have studied is remarkably similar. Minor differences between Polish and Russian and, and Ukrainian and so forth, but 
but remarkably similar, at least as similar as the grammar uh, structure, uh, you know, the differences between French, Spanish, Italian. So it's grammatically very similar. However, quite different when it comes to vocabulary. More different than Spanish is from Italian or from French. And uh, in a way, in terms of vocabulary, the sort of outlier, the, the one with the largest lexical difference or distance, as they say, seems to be Russian. Uh, in other words, I found that Czech, Polish, and Ukrainian, in terms of their vocabulary, were closer together than was Russian. Although grammatically, Ukrainian was closer to Russian, perhaps, and certainly in the writing system that they use, which is closer, it, it's in fact a form of Cyrillic. Um, the reasons for this, uh, it, of course, are, are all historical. Uh, there was nothing that said a thousand years ago when the proto-Slavs were breaking up wherever they were, or 1500, no, sorry, that would have been 2005, whenever it was, I can't remember, don't remember what I read, uh, that, that there would be these divisions that we have today. But there were influences like uh, the Orthodox Church and Church Slavonic. There was the impact of the, uh, of the uh, you know, uh, Mongol invasions, which meant that the original Eastern Slavic nation built around Kiev split up and so you had Muscovy up north, and then the southern sl sort of part of the Kievan Rus became, it, it increasingly was under the influence of Poland or Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And so they developed more as part of that political entity, and in fact were a, a significant, um, you know, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had a lot more Ukrainians in it and Belarusians than Lithuanians. The Lithuanians were insignificant, and, and the Lithuanian leadership gradually became more, uh, you know, can, spoke more and more Polish as Polish became the dominant language. And the Poles, as is often the case with uh, societies where you have more than one language group, they became quite intolerant in their approach to the uh, Orthodox Ukrainians, and that's why at some point a portion of the Ukrainian uh, Cossacks under leadership of Melnitsky, I think, broke away and went off to seek help from the Russians. So w with that, and over time, as part of Ukraine came under Russian control, and of course you know, the Russians were less tolerant of the Ukrainians, so they tried to suppress the Ukrainian language. Uh, so you had all of that kind of evolution. And similarly, between the Czechs and, and, and the Poles, I mean, there were a lot of uh, kings that were common to Poland and, and uh, Czech lands, Moravia. In fact, there was that going back a thousand years, there was even a greater Moravia. Um, and then in those lands, you had the Germans coming in. And so lots of different, different influences, including the influence of the Catholic Church as Polish and uh, the Poles and the Czechs became part of the Catholic world. So all of these things influenced the language. However, <laughs> As a learner, if I were to learn those languages, uh, I would go in the following order. I would learn Russian first because it's the biggest, biggest in terms of numbers of speakers, biggest in terms of, rightly or wrongly, the extent to which their writers are celebrated around the world. Uh, they're more famous than Polish or Czech or Ukrainian writers, although this might be a prejudice on my part, but I would start with Russian. And with that, you'll get the basics of how the grammar works. Although certain minor things are different, and of course the endings w are completely different, but the principles under which these languages operate are more or less the same. And then with each language, you have to learn the vocabulary of that language. Fortunately, for each one of those four languages, I have found ample resources via the internet uh, whether it be audiobooks and ebooks for Russian, there's an abundance of books that you can download and import into Link. Uh, as I've said many times, I found Echo Moskvi a phenomenal resource because every day there's tens of interviews with transcripts put up. Uh, with Czech, I found uh, you know uh, this history series Tolki Česko Milosti, Yaktovidi. Unfortunately, they no longer publish the transcripts for that. But that was very helpful to me, and you can find ebooks and audiobooks for Czech. Similarly, with Polish, I was able to find ebooks and audiobooks. I haven't had the same success with finding Ukrainian 
ebooks and audiobooks because wherever you search it's all basically this is free that is free and I'm not that interested in free I'm happy to pay for a decent ebook with audiobook so with Ukrainian I rely largely on Hromatske Radio which is a very interesting source of podcasts daily on events in Ukraine both in Russian and Ukrainian and Radio Svoboda where often they will have texts with audio so there are resources on the internet for those languages and as you discover them you discover this Slavic world and and there are certain characteristics in common and I was asked whether I found that there was there were these similarities between Slavic peoples and I must say that I find that there are some but more than that it depends on on individual people so there are the sort of intellectuals who are more call it worldly there are those that are more stridently uh, you know we are the best uh, there's a whole range uh, and I think that's probably true for most cultures so um, I am very happy that I went after four languages within the Slavic collection of languages and I may go after the maybe Serbo-Croatian particularly if I decide to go there on holidays uh, similarly I have my group of, of uh, romance languages and it's fun to explore the differences between Spanish Portuguese Italian French and so forth and and of course Romanian is a bit of an outlier Germanic languages uh, between my Swedish my English and I, my German uh, the little bit that I've looked at Dutch I don't think it would be difficult to learn so I all I can say is it's fun to explore these different language families and uh, over the course of history, uh, different people who spoke one language maybe were converted into speakers of another language. So there's really no connection between genetics or genetic code or anything in language. It's more a matter of, of circumstance and history. And exploring these languages is a great way to explore what we are as, as human beings. Uh, oh, and I should say also on my uh, Asian language side, uh, obviously Chinese was a very, or Mandarin was a good base for Japanese and Korean, even though those languages, although they borrowed a lot of vocabulary from Chinese, are part of a different uh, different language uh, family. So there you have it, uh, in the sunshine, squinting. I hope this was of interest. And uh, for those who like the longer uh, ramble, you got it. And uh, we'll talk again. Bye for now.